I kept putting pressure on her every day. Honey, I need a decision because I'm a planner. I, I got to sell the house. I got to get all these jobs for all these employees. I got to finish up all of our work. I got to do this and this and this. And I started programming in my mind what I had to do. Finally, she said, Lynn, I've had enough. No more pressure. She said, here's an envelope. And I don't want you to touch it. I'm putting it in my desk drawer. I've told the Lord three things. If he makes those three things happen, then I'll know he's calling us. I remember going off to work that day, alone in my truck, telling the Lord, Lord, you gave me Peggy. Now it's your problem. <laughs> I asked her, this was in February, I said, how long am I going to have to wait? How long does the Lord have to answer these three petitions? She said, by the time the kids get out of school, late May, early June, I go, no, I got to do this and this and this because I'm going to college in late August, early August, actually. I got to be there in college and I, I was already planning. I got to do all this. I got to do. It was all about what I thought I had to do. But when God moves on your life, you do your best and he does the rest. So she had declared, you know, I have to wait till the kids get out of school. And oh, it was only like a, two weeks later. We had taken a three-day vacation because when you're a plumber and you have employees, you can't take a week off. It's like milking cows. You've got to be there almost every day. Well, anyway, I went, we went on this three-day vacation. We came back. Went to, she went to work Monday morning. She had her calls. I dispatched all the guys out. I went out on the jobs as well. And when I came back home, she got home early because she got all of her service calls done. And there she was, my wife. My wife, a girl that had been raised up in a town called Jugtown in the Appalachian Mountains of Maryland. She was tough. Yet there she was at her desk crying, crying. Instantly, I knew something was wrong. I went over, I said, honey, what's the matter? She opened up the letter and all three things had happened in less than two weeks. And then I got this cold chill that went over. We're really going to do this. <laughs> and we did. By God's grace, he blessed us. We went off to Bible college and four years later, we gave all the money we had from selling everything to the Bible college. And I remember sitting there as I'm going through the classes to be a pastor, studying the Bible for four years. I would get ulcers in my stomach thinking about the first sermon I would have to share because I was shy. I share that with you tonight because what God is giving you and planting in your thoughts and feelings from the word and the word only. He will cause it to grow, your faith will blossom, and you will end up in places you never imagined. I'm glad God didn't reveal to me when he called me how many times I would be speaking around the globe in 126 different cities. I'm glad he didn't reveal the challenges I've faced in different cities where Muslims come in, look at me crossways, I like them, are you good or evil? We just left Indonesia and, and saw a room three times this size with young people from the university that had all the Muslim garb on. And yet, you know, night after night, they would wait there for a half an hour after the meeting was over and ask us questions. And they wanted us to pray with them. And just the love that came out of those Muslims, it was amazing. God is very much alive and well and working on planet Earth today. Can you respond? All right, so Daniel 3, again, Jesus tells his people in the time of the end, a message that goes around the globe tonight to read and understand this book. We discovered in, in chapter 1, Jesus turned seeming defeat into what, friends? Oh, you're quiet. Jesus turned seeming defeat into what? Victory. Victory. Why? Because Daniel and his three friends were found ten times wiser. He reaches those who get hit with the unexpected. Daniel chapter 2, Jesus reveals himself as the true prophet as he gave Daniel and his friends the message, the dream, the interpretation that Nebuchadnezzar would understand the truth. How does Jesus reach people in chapter 2? He reaches those who want to be used by God but seem to have been forgotten. How? Because there was a certain amount of time. You'll notice this is chapter 1, 606 B.C. Chapter 2, recorded 603 B.C. A certain amount of time, Daniel and his three friends were forgotten as the ten times wiser wise men. And when the king gets in trouble, he calls all the wise men, but Daniel and his three friends weren't called until the last when they're ready to kill all the wise men. Now tonight, 
You remember what we said last night? Time is either our greatest asset or our greatest liability, depending on what we do with our time. You folks are using your time wisely. Why? Because you put the red button away three nights in a row, and you're here. Those kind of choices is like money in the kingdom of God. Currency. Investing your time in your creator's mission. So now tonight, we're going to look at chapter 3, and it happens 23 years later after Daniel reveals the Daniel 2 dream to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, what is 23 years going to do? Watch. First of all, Daniel's not even mentioned in this chapter. Most commentators say, as you saw in the movie, he was sent out of town because Nebuchadnezzar's wise men, Arioch attendants, knew that he would not compromise when they were going to set that golden image up for a war, worship. But his other three friends, maybe they'll buckle if Daniel's out of town. I hope you're hearing the message tonight. How many times does your leaders of your church or your denomination wait till the pastor's overseas somewhere and then quickly enact things in the church because they know the pastor's not going to agree with it? Daniel chapter 3, it's a fascinating topic that Jesus places right in the right time. Now remember, Daniel's filled with prophecies and stories. The stories are equally important as the prophecies. The prophecies reveal the epics or the unique time periods that we must grab a hold of, where God really moved. And coming events, your lifetime in Revelation, it depicts what's going to happen in the near days, not months. Not years, the near days. If this last election didn't wake us up as Christians to say, something is happening unusual. If that didn't happen in your mind, hang in there. In a coming night, we're talking about how near the end is, and you will know where we are in prophecy. The stories, on the other hand, reveal the prayer life, the faith that God's people will have. So that we know when God leads us into this environment that He's the one working in our life. Coming nights... Starting Friday, as a matter of fact, we're going to step into a deeper digest of the Word, the meat of the Word, if I may. We're going to see these symbols come alive. Jesus gives us these symbols that we can know the Bible is holy, set aside for God's use. Again, God is the true prophet. He's the one that the source of information for the future comes Again, God is our Redeemer. Remember what Redeemer means? Showing your true value. Tonight's message is to help God's people understand in the time of the end, not only will God turn your worst moments into a time of victory, not only does He have your future, but friends, tonight He wants you to know that if God has your future, your third chapter is to understand that we have a value in the mind of our Creator that is far greater than we can imagine. When God called me from plumbing, if He would have told me the value that He had for me in the future, I would have been scared to death, I'd have had a heart attack, and I would have died. If He would have revealed to me that I'd be standing in a field of 5,000 people in Africa preaching for six hours, I would have died of a heart attack just imagining that coming in years ahead. If you go to my Facebook picture, that's the picture right there on the front. I'll never forget it. Arriving there in Tanzania a week before my first speaking engagement, I thought, it's a big time difference. I need to rest. I need to get acclimated so that I'm fresh and charged. Oh, no, no, no. As soon as that plane landed in, in Dar es Salaam, the taxi driver come and said, I've got to take you to show you where you're preaching tomorrow. I said, what? <laughs> yes, an hour's drive out of the city into the bush country. Now, I was a farm boy until I was 12 years old. I know what cows are. It was a dairy farm in Maryland. Takes me out into the bush country, and finally he stops on this dirt road. Nobody around, no mud huts anywhere. And I looked through the, the bush. There's an opening in the bush there, and I could see some cows in this 40-acre field. He says, get out, Pastor. I said, okay. I thought, what's he going to show me? Some cows? I've seen We have those in America. He said, no, no, come here. I'm showing you where you're going to preach tomorrow. I said, really? Okay, Lord, you're going to feed me humble pie. Maybe this is what I need now. I looked in the field, and there was cows in the middle of this field. Cow pals everywhere. You know what cow pals are? 
They were everywhere. And I thought, finally I asked him, I said, do you really have a church worshiping here? No, but tomorrow we will. I said, I didn't see any churches around. No, don't worry, Pastor. How did you get the word out? Don't worry, Pastor. Sure enough, next morning, I was supposed to start my first lecture at 9.30 in the morning. He picks me up at 8.30. I get there. But the last mile, the road was so packed with people that he couldn't hardly drive down the road. They would part the people to let the taxi cab take us down to there. When I got to the field and looked in the field, it was a sea of people. I got out of the car, and as true as I stand here, I couldn't speak one word for an hour and a half. I was so choked up. I thought, in America, we send out 70,000 brochures, and look who comes. In Africa, you don't send a single brochure. One person tells another and tells another, and, and then 5,000 people show up. And they, every time I'd get done a one-hour message, they'd say, Pastor, the choir's going to sing one song, and then you get back up and preach again. Six hours in the sun, over 500 children you'll see in the picture sat there and didn't make a sound for six hours. And I wasn't even speaking their language. I'll never forget it. I put it on the front page of the Facebook because it reminds me I have nothing to fear for the future lest I forget how God has led me in the past. Don't sit there thinking you're not going to do anything great for God because of who you are. Take your eyes off yourself. Lift your face and your mind up to your Creator God. Don't you miss tomorrow night. I guarantee you it will help you understand your value. For your creator created you in such detail, man can't even reproduce one of your cells without taking another cell to make a cell. See, God took nothing and made you. Man can't take one cell and make another cell. Don't ever underestimate the power that God has placed in your temple that he lives in. When he calls you, he will equip you. Too many churches spend days trying to figure out your spiritual gift. We need to look to our creator. He equips you as he calls you. If we can figure out what kind of gift you already have, we don't need our creator. The moment we are not dependent on God is the moment we're going down instead of up. Tonight, Daniel is out of the scene. And his three friends are going to be tested to the max. And God said, read and understand it because you will go through a similar challenge. Tomorrow night, we're going to see how God reveals himself in a way that truly will help us understand your value. Look at chapter three with me as we continue tonight. Nebuchadnezzar, your next door neighbor in heaven. On one side, Donald Trump will be on the other. And Obama will be living right there with you too. Some of you lost your vision for home. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, silver, brass, iron, concrete. Oh, come on, brothers and sisters. I'm just a mailman delivering the mail. Am I giving the wrong mail or what? What's going on here? An image of what? The king didn't like his dream. He lost the faith in what God gave him in 23 years. He wanted to make his kingdom greater by investing more money in our military budget. I mean, I got off track there, but it's the same thing. He thought he could change his future based upon his works instead of trusting in his creator. God gave Nebuchadnezzar the gift of a true prophet when Nebuchadnezzar didn't go to church one time. Grab a hold of that. Sometimes Christians are tempted to think that the good people go to church. Be careful. God will use whoever he can use to get his work done. Now, I'm not saying we are not called by God when we go to church. We should be going to church. But that doesn't make us greater than everybody else because God created all mankind. And the last thing he does before Jesus comes is he bathes the entire world with grace. 
that all might receive the gift of eternal life. All right, so, so he brings up this image of gold whose height was three score cubits. Now, just for some of you like details, and it's fascinating, a cubit was the distance from the elbow to the tip of the finger, the longest finger of the king, approximately 18 inches. But if any of you are contractors or cabinet makers or carpenters or like, every time they get a new king, you get a new ruler because the cubit changed. All right, so figure that, approximately 18 inches. Three score would be 60, because the score is how many? 20, okay, so 60 cubits by 6. And he set it up in the plain of door in the providence of Babylon. All right, so 60 by 6, if we're talking about the cubits. And remember, numerology is very powerful in the Bible, the study of numbers. 6 is always one short of what? 7 being the perfect number. So here we're seeing it. Man's works always will fall short of what God will do in us. Verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar the king sent together together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, and the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the province to come together, dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king, what? Had set up. Another little key for you to understand what a chapter of the Bible is trying to serve to us through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, is whenever a phrase is used over and over and over again in the same chapter. Like we found out the word eunuch, Daniel became a eunuch, nine times. Here we see the word had set up, the king had set up being repeated over and over and over again, almost to the place of annoyance. God saying, I had nothing to do with this. This was the world superpower leader thinking that if he just did X, Y, Z, he could cause his kingdom to last forever. He set this up. God had nothing to do with it. Even though the king had Daniel give him a ten time wiser mind in chapter 1. Even though Daniel gave him the interpretation and the dream in chapter 2. Chapter 3, the king still decides 